Hello, my friend, and welcome back to the podcast. We are going to talk about mom fears. And I have an expert on that topic with me today. She's a wife, mom of four, certified life coach, author, podcaster, and cancer survivor. Her name is Amy Debrick, and I'm so excited to have her on because we are going to dig into the different types of fears, how to discern them, and then how to overcome them. Motherhood is hard, and we don't have to carry the weight of it alone. Come grab a cup of coffee as we chat about how to apply our faith to motherhood so we can live each day with the kind of joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm your host, Hannah Lapsansky, and this is the Moms Grab Coffee Podcast. As Amy's worked with a lot of moms, I asked her during the conversation, what is the number one fear among uh, us mothers? And she said it's actually self-doubting our parenting. So we're going to dig specifically into that arena and also get into maybe more of those traditional fears when it comes to our children, specifically the fear for our children when we can't be there to physically protect them. So if you've got some mom fears, you are in the right place today, mama. All right, let's get into the chat. It is my pleasure to welcome Amy Debrick. Well, Amy, I'm excited for you to join the show because we're going to talk about mom fears. And I think everyone can say over the last few years, fear has probably played a bigger part in our lives in general. And then when you break it down to um, fear specific to our motherhood journeys, I think everything just gets elevated and it's getting more and more elevated every day. And it's probably because just the fast consumption of information and the distribution distribution of information just makes our minds kind of swirl into bigger and bigger and bigger fears. And so I'd love to start with, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll kind of go through, you know, what is, what are the different types of fears and how do we overcome them? So I'm a mom of four. So when you said you're a mom of three, I know what that's like. And when a household goes down, it goes down hard when you, (laughs) the more that are in it, right, Hannah? Yes, so true. (laughs) Um, So three of my kids that were out of the house, they're on the West Coast, actually. They couldn't be farther from me at the moment. Um, My oldest daughter's in grad school, and my oldest son is in the Navy right now on his second deployment. And then my younger son is in undergrad school out there. And so that wasn't really our plan to have them all out there after, um, you know, the last two years. But my oldest son, after his first deployment, um, that's where he's stationed is on the West Coast. And they wanted to um, they wanted to move out there because they had the opportunity at that time. My daughter had just finished her undergrad in, on the East Coast here. And then when my younger son found that out, he was like, well, if you're going, I'll go. So they all live together out there. And then my youngest is still a junior in high school. So I always say she gets the short end of the stick because she doesn't have her siblings as backup here. It's just all the attention on her all the time. <laughs> and when you're 16, you're not loving it as much as when you were five, right? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she'll right. love it when uh, she looks back on it many years from now. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm hoping. But in addition to that, which is my main role and my mo- most precious role, I say, is I'm a writer. Um, I coach women in confidence, um, and I'm a podcaster. And so three things that I absolutely love doing in addition to motherhood. Yeah. And you've had quite a journey around fear and uh, tragedy as well, which I think can elevate fear, right? So let's just go into uh, an overview of mom fears in general. I'm really interested to know, do you find that there are different types of mom fears? So I think you know the, the obvious ones are going to come to surface, but is there a, should we be thinking about that in categories as a way to figure out how do we overcome and identify the roots of those fears? I think Hannah, you know, it's interesting and you're the first person to really ask me that, but I do think it's really important, especially today when there are so many things to be fearful of, or it seems like there should be things to be fearful of, is to really take the pause and break them down. Because I think that helps eliminate the anxiety 
that comes with those fears. And so when we can actually take a moment to say, okay, this is a rational fear. Okay. There is a, a an actual threat that we need to be addressing or something that's an imminent danger or something like that, as opposed to, and this is most of the fears that we have are, are irrational fears. And there are those fears of what if, what if this happens? Well, what if that happens? Well, what if, you know, and so if, when we get stuck in that holding place of not really breaking it down and identifying, okay, this is an irrational fear and I can't stay in this place, I think then we can really start peeling back the layers to find out what is the root then? Why is it caught? Why am I always, um, you know, getting triggered by whatever this is and re, you know, birthing this fear every single time? And so I think that that's a great practice that we don't do enough, especially as moms, um, because fear can be overwhelming and it can rush in and you can be completely unprepared for it when you get those emotions and the feelings. And so I think it's a good practice to just start and take a minute when a fear starts to come over you and ask yourself right in that moment. And I think that's the one thing too, when you begin a practice is that um, it becomes more of second nature and habit. And so rather than having the fear just run you over You can pause and kind of take control of it by just even asking yourself. And that doesn't mean that you still might not feel fearful, but at least you have a handle on it by pausing and taking control in that moment to say, okay, is this an irrational fear? And what is the actual logic behind what my fear is? And then you can kind of, like I said, start going from there. Yeah, I like that because I've also had guests who've broken down anxiety and like what is the root of anxiety? Because like fear on the surface, I think when you feel anxious, your mind can immediately go to what you think is a logical place. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you know, I'm anxious about X, Y, Z. And I think fear, that can happen with fear as well. Um, Like your mind can move past the irrational part into what you think is rational. And yes, logically, you should be fearful of that. So how do you discern between what is an irrational fear and you should stay in that ir- irrational place versus, okay, this is rational and I need to do something uh, about it. I mean, one of the things I coach women in the most, because I think you're right, that is you can easily just um, train your brain really to kind of just buy into the fear to yeah. a, an unhealthy degree. And I think the the easiest and best way to do that is really kind of just, you know, ask yourself, is this something that I have any control over? And I think you kind of need to start there because if if it's a matter of like, I'm worried that my child's going to get hit by a car as we're crossing the street, okay, that's different than yes, I need to hold their hand and and there's some logical steps that need to be put into place to counteract that and, and to really, you know, disable that fear in that way. Those are more practical steps. But if it's something that you can't control but it's still just ruminating and you're and it's be- becoming major anxiety. I mean, those are the times when you really need to discern like, okay, if I can't control this outcome, how am I how do I need to address this fear? Because it's it's and there isn't necessarily um because everybody has different fears. I, I there's not like one specific thing I can throw out there, but I know in general from the women that I coach, the, the words that I hear time and time again, regardless of whether it's in your parenting, um, in your personal life, in your professional life, is they overthink things. And I think the overthinking and the self-doubt is stemming from that. I want a specific outcome and I just don't know if I'm going to get it. And so you just become, almost, it's almost debilitating. And so I think you really need, the discernment has to start with can I control this outcome? And if I can't, what so, what are some steps that I can do to move past this fear? Yeah. What do you find in your conversations with moms is the number one fear right now? Well, you know, interestingly enough, I think it's that they overthink or they self-doubt their parenting. Because I think today with all of the influences that our children are just bombarded with, even the most secure person, the most grounded uh, woman parenting feels sometimes like, gosh, did I do that the right way? 
maybe I should have done it this way because there's, you know, when we were growing up, Hannah, we didn't have that. I don't think our parents even, it wasn't a consideration. You, you knew what your morals were, you knew what your values were, and you just parented from that. But we didn't have like the minute you opened your phone or your laptop or whatever, I mean, those things just weren't at our fingertips. And so you didn't have the distraction and the second guessing of, I mean, you may have like had off days and like, I could have done that better, of course, and, and that type of thing, but not to the level and degree that parents and moms are facing today, where, like I said, even the strongest woman who feels completely convicted in her, in her parenting style, those are the women that I'm talking to. And they're like, I mean, do you think I handled that the right way or, sh- yeah. you know, sh- but so-and-so's mom let her go. And now I'm wondering if I should have done that. Those are the things we're just mm-hmm. in, in, t- in nine times out of 10, their initial and their core root was right. It's just the distractions are what's causing moms to overthink. Yeah, I think you're so right. How do we overcome those fears and have more confidence in what we're doing? I think the first thing, and and I don't say this flippantly because it seems almost too simple, um, but it's a daily, it needs to become a daily practice. And that is surrendering what we cannot control. And I think when we begin every day with that mindset, there's so many things when you get up in a day, even if you're not expecting them that you may run into where fear can definitely be prevalent right? Um, Whether it's with your kids or your own situation, maybe your health or whatever the case is. And I think if we begin every day by letting those things go in a surrender, and I use the word surrender because that's my way of saying letting things go that are outside of our controls. And also the second piece to that is after doing that, then being okay with giving our best. So I'm not saying be totally hands off, like, okay, well, you know, whatever it is, it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, but I am saying once you do surrender and you do put the intention and effort into whatever that is to, to your extent that you can, you have to also be okay with knowing that that was your best. And then that's good enough. Because the other thing I think women and moms run into is I could have done a better job. Well, we, everybody could do better. Nobody's perfect, but to get stuck and hung up in that space can be, become really damaging and it can really, um, affect your self-confidence in what you're doing and, and your parenting and all of that. And I think we need to be better with being okay with what our best looks like because everybody's best is going to look different on any given day. Some days I'm totally on it and I listen good and I'm, you know, on it with my meals and the whole nine yards. And then some days I'm totally off, off. And I need to, you know, whether that's a private conversation between my spouse and I, or my kids and I, and there's different ways to reconcile it. But knowing that you gave your best needs to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about those times when you know that you didn't give your best? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think when you know that you didn't give your best, I think it's just a matter of going back to why was that? What were, where did the system start to break down here? And that's kind of going back to the root. Cause I think a lot of times if we don't let those, if we don't address the root and really dig deep and find out what is causing it, cause normally there is a certain trigger that will, you know, keep bringing the same thing back. Those are the things we need to address because then if we're not addressing them, then we're not really putting that time and effort into figuring out, okay, how can I get past this? Because at that point, then it is overtaking you and it's dictating your relationships. It's dictating your, how you're functioning on a day-to-day basis. Maybe it's dictating your communication um, with not only your children, but maybe with other moms. And so I think it's important to do the self-work in addition to that. When you aren't regularly having those good days, you need to determine why is that? What is the fear that's really holding me back? Yes. Yes. Love that. Um, I want to go back to surrender and what that practically looks like. How do you actually put that into practice? You know, it took me years, Hannah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to put that into practice because I was a control freak. That's my wiring is to, you know, want to have everything just the way I want it mm-hmm. and uh, and plan for that. And I think um, 
well, I had a couple of tragedies early on, but then my, I had a cancer diagnosis at age 40. And that was, um, I say, to an extent saved my life because I think sometimes until you're presented with something spectacular like that, and especially when it's affecting your own mortality, you have two choices. You can kind of keep running in that direction where you still need to control every outcome or you can kind of trust God in whatever that process is going to look like for you. And so for me, it was the latter. I was exhausted from the constant spinning of my own wheels of what I wanted to happen, what I thought was going to happen, what needed to happen. And to me, it was a freedom in being able to say, okay, this is what I can do and I'm going to do it. And then the rest, I just need to let go of because it becomes exhausting. I mean, it, and, and that in and of itself affects your confidence because you just never feel enough. You're just, you just can never get to that place to control every single outcome. But when you're constantly in that mindset of trying, it's exhausting. And you're really not giving your best to anybody, including yourself. Yeah. I love that you said you're trusting God. Uh, Did that look like um, prayer? Did that look like, you know, raising your hand, like physical worship? What did that look like? Um, I mean, initially it was on my knees in that moment. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, it was a submission of just getting on my knees and, you know, getting back to the basics really. Um, Before that I had done all of the typical things when I had struggled with anxiety, I had been in um, Bible studies. I had read my Bible. I had never really felt like I was, had any disassociation with God. What I wasn't doing though, is letting him lead the way I was kind of having, I always tried to use the analogy of being in a car ride and I would always have him in the passenger seat and I was the one driving and navigating, which is so foolish, Hannah, because if you knew me, I can't drive myself out of this small, tiny town without putting my GPS on. So just in that sense, it's amazing that I did that for so long, but I really needed to let him take the reins and take control. And and even though that is extremely frightening, and so for anyone listening to that, it's not an easy practice. And that's why I say, I don't say surrender flippantly, but when you start making that your daily habit, it's like anything else. It's a muscle that you haven't used and now it just becomes a little bit stronger each time. And that becomes your default over the worrying and the what ifs. Because a lot of times when we're stuck in overthinking and self-doubt, there's always what-ifs attached to that. And so the what-ifs become a little bit less when the surrender becomes a little bit more. And so surrendering really can be obviously unique to however anybody wants to do it. There's no right or wrong way, but really it's just the idea of letting go and really putting into practice of letting God take over and not let those thoughts dominate you until whatever it is needs to play out. So it's, it's a practice though. It's not a one and done. And it's certainly not for me, it was not an overnight. It was an overnight surrender of this is what I'm going to choose to do from now on, but it's a daily discipline. I can imagine how hard that must've been as well while you were going through your cancer season, because I'm sure you had thoughts of what's going to happen with my kids. I'm not going to be able to be there for them. Uh, I'm not going to be able to walk them through, you know, their unique seasons in life. So I want to take that kind of scenario, whether it is, you know, something scary as cancer or or a different kind of scary, like, um, you know, things that happen at school, whether that sure. is, you know, bullying or, you know, school shootings, God forbid, when we can't be there for our kids, like physically protect them when they're out there in the world. And we have that, that fear that's beginning to feel debilitating. What do Mm -hmm. we do? Mm. I think those are the moments that sometimes you need to bring somebody in. Sometimes, I mean, at my highest or heightened, I should say, anxiety, the biggest disservice I think I did for myself was to try to keep it all in and navigate it solely on my own. And I think sometimes it's, it's, this is where gleaning from somebody that's maybe just a little bit gone before you 
or just being able to verbalize it to somebody else. And then having that rational discussion to have somebody bring logic into the conversation, because those things are all real and they can all happen. But the reality is sometimes we need an outside voice to remind us that even when we know it, um, you know, like even when you're practicing surrendering and, and trying to let it go, but sometimes those thoughts just stick. That's just what it is. And so I have found, and I do encourage women that I talk, coach all the time, have a person that you can, you know, call up and, and talk it out. There is something hugely cathartic and freeing about having a conversation with somebody else. And every single time I've left one, when I've had a moment like that, you just naturally feel better. You just, the anxiety goes because you have, it's like, you know, the logic, but sometimes we can't apply the logic. And so we need to have somebody else conversing that back to us. It's like, we know it, but it's just like when, you know, you're just stuck in your, your own head, which is basically what that is. And so I always encourage people to have a person or people that they can go to in those times where you need a little bit more and there's oak and that's okay. You know, I think that there's also a shame or we think that there's always got to be one thing to, to get us to the next step. And sometimes it's multiple things. Sometimes it's not just, you know, surrender along with, you know, I'm, I'm saying surrender, but that's along with other practices that, you know, have to be unique to each individual. Surrender may just work for one person. And just be like, every day, this is this is what I'm doing. And then that's it. And the stuff just rolls right off them after that. But that's not every woman. And that's okay that that's not every woman. And you may need to have your support person. You may need to have counseling in addition to that. You may need a life coach. Whatever it is that you need to support the surrender and supporting to letting it go, that's what you need to do. Yeah, I like that you said that there are multiple tactics to address all the perhaps unique fears that you may have have because there may be one common fear across the board, but then when you break it down, the roots could all be completely different for each mom. Um, I want to go back to finding that person or that that group where you can open up to them. I would guess that nine out of ten times, maybe even ten out of ten times, once you take that scary step because it can be really hard to be vulnerable and open up to someone Mm. and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Once you do that, I would bet that what you receive is love and is that comfort rather than someone being like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? You know, So um, finding that person or that group, how do you go about doing that? What's your best advice there? Well, I think you also, there's some discernment that needs to go there. Because not every one of our close friends is that person that's going to pull us out of those places. I think we all have friends with different personalities and some have more of an, an, maybe a little more of a negative undertone just in general, and some have more of an uplifting and positive outlook. And so obviously from the get-go, use some discernment there and make sure you're you know, reaching out to who's going to lift you out of this instead of who might be accidentally keeping you there. Because I don't think anybody intentionally would be like, oh yeah, we should really be worrying about this. But there are people in our lives that sometimes they hold on to certain things. And so that wouldn't be the person for you to be extending to when you are or going to be vulnerable. And you're right. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was not somebody who was ever vulnerable before my journey started. I could, I would say face, I could have multiple conversations, but I never let anybody really scratch the surface. And again, that was more of my pride. I didn't want people to know that I was struggling. I didn't, you know, want people to know that, you know, fear was kind of overtaking me. And so you don't share. And so there's something to be said for, and I highly encourage any woman out there that is in that place right now to take that leap of faith to be vulnerable. There is a huge difference between transparency and vulnerability. And when you are vulnerable with the right person or the right people, it can be life-changing in a positive way. And so I would really highly encourage that. Mm. What an excellent point about discerning who you open up to. Um, I never thought about it that way, but you're so right. There are going to be different responses that you receive and you want to make sure you're getting 
uh, what you need rather than someone adding dirt to sure not the fire but dirt to the situation I guess <laughs> yeah because sometimes you don't know you know some it's and I and I say that in a, the most loving way because some people necessarily no no friend of yours is going to intentionally want to hold you down mm-hmm. but it's the conversations where after the fact if you're not feeling like a weight has been lifted but you're questioning more things then that's not the person for you yeah yeah excellent point well amy this has been such a fascinating conversation uh where can moms go to learn more about you and uh connect sure well you can go to um i'm normally on instagram go to my handle is amydebrick.com. Um, you can also sign up t- for my um, newsletter I send out every week. It's an encouragement newsletter and there's some practical resources and tips that are free. You can download and print, save, share, whatever you want to do with those. And my website is amydebrick.com as well. If the last name is, sounds daunting to find, spell or whatever, you can also go to surrenderyourfear.com. And that'll take you right to the website as well. It's just another avenue to get there. And all the resources and podcasts um, and everything is right there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. We'll have all of those links in the show notes. Um, And this was fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. It was a nice conversation this morning. All right, Mama, that was Amy Debrick, and I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you are enjoying Mom's Grab Coffee, would you mind just taking a quick second to drop a rating or write a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening? That keeps me encouraged and tells me, hey, the show is helping you with faith and your motherhood journey. Okay, Mama, I'll be back next week for another episode of Mom's Grab Coffee, so make sure you are following the show wherever you're listening. And I'll catch you again next time for a cup of coffee with a side of faith, wisdom, and hope.